Uh, right now, I'd like to start by introducing our first speaker, Dr. Alan Morrow, who's coming from the University of Utah. And we'll get started. We can get our slides up. I just want to remind everybody as she's coming up here that we do have the application that you can ask questions through. So if you don't want to come up to the mic and you have questions, please feel free to ask them and ask them as the sessions are going on as you think about them so that you don't forget them later. Thank you. I'd like to thank Sages and Dr. Stellum and Aoyang for the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon about um, perioperative management of patients with paraesophageal hernias. I have no disclosures. So this is a brief outline for this talk. I'm going to talk first about the preoperative workup for paraesophageal hernia, then a bit about patient selection and risk stratification, and then some tips for intraoperative and postoperative management. So this is an outline of the disease-specific workup for the paraesophageal hernia. Endoscopy is an important part of that workup, but Dr. Hinojosa is going to be speaking about that later in this panel, so I won't address that further. Um, a combination of the other studies you'll usually want to combine to evaluate your patient's disease process. pH, I won't address further beyond this slide either. If you were seeing a patient who had a type 1 sliding hiatal hernia, then pH would be a mandatory part of the workup because that would be your main indication to operate. But for a paraesophageal or type 2, 3, or 4 hernia, generally uh, the hernia itself is more the indication to operate, and so pH can be helpful to define a baseline for patients who are presenting primarily with reflux symptoms, but is not absolutely mandatory. So CT scan is something that your patient's likely to have before you evaluate them, especially if they've been seen in an emergency department. Um, it can provide you a lot of helpful information about the anatomy of the hernia, especially as you can see in this case, which is a large type 4. CT is a good study to show you other organs that may be involved, such as the colon here. A uh, barium esophagram, or upper GI, is usually the go-to study that we think of as surgeons for defining the anatomy. It gives you more dynamic information. It can grossly give you an idea of esophageal motility, although it's not as accurate as manometry for that. And it can grossly uh, show you a picture of their reflux as well, if they have a significant amount of reflux. And importantly, in the acute setting, the upper GI can be very useful for evaluating for obstruction. So this is an image of a high-resolution manometry study, and centrally here you can see what's basically a normal swallow, and then on either side you have two hypotensive swallows. So again, it's not my task to discuss uh, fundoplication choice, but this can be a helpful part of the preoperative workup because it may affect your operative planning in that way. A bit about patient selection and the risk-benefit analysis. This, in my view, is really a moving target. Um, the idea of watchful waiting as a very acceptable strategy for minimally symptomatic and asymptomatic patients with paraesophageal hernia really uh, became promoted in 2002 with this decision analysis where the incarceration rate was defined as lower than previously thought at 1% per year. So, <clears throat> however, the downside of doing the repair or the morbidity and mortality is also a moving target. As Dr. Truss showed in his more recent NISQIP analysis, the expected mortality rate for uh, laparoscopic elective repair, even in elderly patients, can be as low as 0.5%. So I would say that the risk-benefit analysis is a moving target, but the SAGES guidelines, which I would recommend that you refer to, still recommend watchful waiting as a, uh, an acceptable strategy for minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic paraesophageal hernias. Now, if your patient has symptoms, and those could be anything from obstructive to reflux, to anemia, to pulmonary symptoms such as recurrent infections or shortness of breath, then you're going to recommend a repair most likely. And then in the acute setting, of course, you have a different risk-benefit analysis, and most of those patients are going to go on to repair for uh, acute incarceration or obstruction. Other things that may assess, affect your uh, risk assessment. So, the strongest risk factors for adverse outcome in a paraesophageal hernia repair include age, uh, an urgent nature of the operation, congestive heart failure, and pulmonary disease. So the history and physical is really the most powerful tool for risk assessment, and you want to pay close attention especially to the patient's functional capacity, which for a lot of these patients, unfortunately, is, is not great. A lot of them are quite frail. And these are some additional tests that may help you uh, stratify the patient's risk for an operation electively. 
So a few tips for intraoperative management. Um, these patients are at high risk for aspiration at the time of intubation. And if your anesthesia colleagues aren't working with these patients frequently, they may not know that. So it's a good idea to be present in the operating room at the time of intubation. And if they aren't thinking along those lines, you may want to suggest techniques to minimize that risk, such as rapid sequence. Pleural perforation does occur relatively commonly in these repairs. The pleura can be quite adherent to the sac and a parasophageal hernia. Um, Fortunately, that's not usually a big issue, but a few tips to manage that so that you can continue the operation laparoscopically include um, you know, potentially desufflating the abdomen if you need to, if the patient's having some hemodynamic compromise and leveling the patient. You can repair the pleural perforation so that you don't continue to have that leak of CO2 into the chest, either with a suture or a clip. Um, you can lower your insufflation pressure. And all of those things should allow you to uh, continue with your laparoscopic visualization. Fortunately, drainage of the chest or chest tube is not usually required in this case because the CO2 is rapidly reabsorbed. Um, so, you know, don't, don't worry that you're going to have to go that route. That's generally very rarely required. Sub-Q emphysema occurs commonly, and it can be alarming for patients and staff, but generally is not clinically uh, significant. That's just a consequence of the extensive mediastinal dissection. And then there's no consensus on intraoperative fluid management for these cases. In terms of post-op post management, um, most surgeons will want their patients to be on a modified diet for anywhere from two to six weeks after this operation, depending on how the patient's progressing, um, from liquids to pureed to, to a soft diet. In terms of activity restrictions, this is certainly a moving target with other types of hernia repair, but I would say for parasophageals, you know, even though there's no evidence basis for this, I still feel more comfortable restricting activity because the recurrence rate is so high, and I would prefer to restrict intra-abdominal pressure and valsalvas as much as possible in patients during the immediate post-operative period. Respiratory insufficiency and pleural effusions are common, if not expected to some extent, after parasophageal hernia repair, and fortunately, you know, this generally improves with time and pulmonary toilet, and I would recommend against uh, drainage of pleural effusions unless it's really necessary for the patient's pulmonary status because you will risk infecting that space that should be sterile immediately postoperatively. And then if your patient does have ongoing symptoms or you think they're having a complication, generally upper GI and endoscopy are going to be the first uh, go-to studies for evaluating that postoperatively. Thank you.